Um, I'm going to have to start this story uh, with a little bit of a backstory so that we all understand where the American Indians, uh, Native American people, the uh, aboriginals that were here originally, where did they come from and how did they get here? Because it's one of the most incredible stories of all. Um, what a lot of us don't realize is that uh, the Sahara de Desert is only about 5,500 years old, right? It's new. And if we look at it, we can't imagine that. But actually, there were huge lakes in it. It was a huge grassland savanna. And then it dried up and became a desert that it is today. There's actually petroglyphs in the areas of the Sahara that show people farming and doing all kinds of things. And so we know that this happened. Now, with a lot of research, we realize that it happens regularly. The last time it got really bad was, like I said, 5,500 years ago. Before that, it seems to dry up during glaciations or the end of a glaciation, just as a because that's where we are right now, right? Our glaciation ended, and we're in kind of a period of warmth. And so the last time it did that was about 130,000 years ago. And it's my feeling that this is the point where human beings actually began leaving Africa. Uh, you want to imagine what that journey was like, because it wasn't easy. Uh, up above, in north of Israel and Syria, and all, it's a mountain range that's very, very hard to cross. And so I believe that most human beings uh, did the opposite. They went to the east, into India, and then into uh, eventually into Australia. We've got dates from Australia for six, 60,000 years ago. Wow. So we know that they left fairly early and that they made that journey all the way to Australia. But what about our people, the American Indians? When did they come? Well, I believe that it was between uh, about 40,000 years ago and 32,000 years, somewhere in there. We'll never really know the exact time that humans made it to the Americas. The evidence is just becoming overwhelming for, for much earlier dates. In White Sands, uh, they discovered footprints that go back 22,500 years. So we know that they were definitely here at that time, but there's so much evidence uh, of an earlier. Thing. Now, when when those people left Africa, we have to understand that uh, our color didn't exist at all, just simply didn't exist. You want to imagine that Europe, uh, London and Paris and Berlin were under ice 14,000 years ago, <laughs> under solid ice. I mean, there was no way you could live there, okay? Now, the Neanderthals were living in the southern part, and we began occupying the southern part of Europe by about 40,000 years ago, all right? We're new. And actually, most of them, like my heritage, I'm German, uh, we would have come from Scandinavia around 6,000 years ago. I mean, that's brand new. When did humans come to North America? I suggest 40,000 years ago, right? Compare those dates. What a difference that makes. Now let's get started here. Uh, what did Florida look like back then when the first humans came? Florida was twice the size that it is today. It was, it was much, much bigger. Uh, eight, from here, you'd have to travel 85 miles out to get to the coast, right? And uh, by the way, the thing about the, uh, the, the uh, passage across to, from Europe to, uh, that never happened that way. Uh, you know, it was, it was open country, supposedly. Now it was a solid ice field. And when all that ice began to melt, it turned into huge lakes. And so there's almost no way that I think that humans could have come any other way than through the Aleutian Islands, and that's by boat. And we're talking about coming by boat 40,000 years ago. But remember Australia. Even at the height of the glaciation, Australia was still separated from the rest of the mainland. They had to get boats to get to Australia. There's no other way. So I believe that our people were, one, using boats uh, probably during the height of the winter months when most of it would have been ice choked. That whole area up there would have been ice choked. And so they made that trip very, very slowly. And 
this is what Florida would have looked like. Now, it was home to a whole bunch of critters, all right? We have to imagine a very different kind of Florida. There were mammoths and uh, horses. Horses galore. You want to think of horses as one of the most common animals in Florida at that time. The, the herds had to be simply huge. There were bison. Now, notice the horns on this bison are not like the horns on our modern bison, much larger. And, and, and of course, there's a giant sloth in this picture, too. What those animals did is they ate a lot. A uh, mammoth can eat about uh, 400 pounds of vegetation every day. Now, what are they doing on the other end? They're getting rid of that, right? And so something is happening. They're eating off the plants, and they're fertilizing the ground at the same time. These huge herds that were all over Florida, they were doing the same thing over and over again for thousands of years. And so plant communities developed a very specific way of living, right? They always knew exactly the cycles when those animals were here, because those animals didn't stay in Florida. They would migrate out during the summer months. Summer in Florida, not something that was great. Now, we had camel-like animals, llama-like animals living in Florida, and they would have been here over the summer months, I predict, for sure. But some of the other animals, they, they wouldn't have stayed. Some of the mammoths and, and mastodons would have. Uh, when the first humans came here, right, what they would have faced was an incredible wilderness, a wilderness that was out of control because all of those big animals had died off 12,900 years ago. By the way, so had all the people that lived here. Gone. The paleo people disappeared, right? Same time, 12,900 years ago. We want to say, well, you know, the truth of it is is that, uh, well, the paleo people killed all the big animals. Well, did they kill themselves? You know, it doesn't make any sense. And many of the Native American pe people that I've talked to, they'll tell you, they'll say, no, we don't come from the north. You keep telling us we come from the north, but we don't come from the north. We come from the south. Well, when you think about it, the disaster 12,900 years ago that tore America to pieces, that wiped out all the big animals and wiped out the human beings, well, it didn't leave anybody here. Where would they have come from? I think it was Central America. Uh, the genetics to date of uh, the paleo hunters uh, lines up very well with the Mayan people. And so we are really starting to realize that that's the direction that this thing came in. So the first people here had to figure out how to live in this kind of an environment. And fire was essential. It was the only thing that would return these environments, Florida environments, back into a normal kind of an environmental cycle. Now I've had college kids tell you, oh, how do you know that? I mean, how does anybody know? We have what are called fire-dependent communities in Florida. That's vegetation, like uh, wire grass wants to burn every year. And all the, all the plants in the wire grass community are very comfortable with burning every year. Then you get things like palmettos. Palmettos are good for about four years. They don't mind being burned every four years, but they have to have time to blossom, and four years gives them time to blossom. Now, for things like sand pine, it takes 14 years. So our native people, the first people here, had to realize that they had different cycles that they had to burn in. And when the Spanish got here, the Spanish talked about them as living in a parkland kind of environment. Well, that's why, because they knew exactly how the environment worked and they were part of it, and they made that happen. Now, this is the, uh, actually from a, uh, I did forensic reconstruction for the corners for years, and so uh, this is a forensic reconstruction of the Win Windover people. Uh, they lived quite a long time ago in the early archaic, uh, between, uh, well, there was, their time was 7,500 years ago to around 7,000 years ago. And so we know that when they came in, it was an extremely stressful environment. And the one thing that shows up on them is uh, damage from uh, bone breaks and things like this. This is an atlatl. This is the tool that was used by these early hunters. Actually, it was used right up to mm, when the Spanish came. It's called an atlatl, and it's a, it's, a, it's a thrower. It throws a dart. This is, this is the one in the picture. Uh, and you hold it like this, it's a baseball throw, and the dart gets stuck in this tip here, and you just pitch it like that. You wouldn't think that that would
do very good. But it actually, uh, the record is a pitch of uh, three football fields, the distance of three football fields. It's very, very powerful. And it's a killer instrument. And this is the kind of stuff that uh, early hunters would have used to bring down mast mastodons and mammoths. Uh, and this is a tump line. We know that uh, people were using these kind of baskets uh, because in the windower's site, when they buried people, they actually buried them with the baskets wrapped right into the bodies. And they were put underwater in this pond, and they were staked down, and the water was anaerobic, and so they, they didn't rot. And so we have the evidence of that uh, going back that far. Now, this is a, this is a seminal will, willowing basket. Baskets were like this were found in uh, the Windover site. So they were already doing all kinds of stuff like that. This is palm fiber. And if you've ever felt a palm fiber, I didn't bring one today, but if you've ever felt a palm fiber brag, they're amazing. They're very plastic feeling. They're just wonderful to carry. These people wouldn't have been stationary. They were working through a cycle that they were wandering through the environment. You know, uh, This month they'd be here, next month they'd be there. They'd be moving along, always looking for the natural resources that were available. Remember, what they were facing was a Florida that was so totally different. Because of the death of all the big animals, it was a wilderness, a terrible wilderness. And it was very hard for those people to adjust. One of the things that is for certain is these are the fibers or the kinds of weaves uh, that they were using. Now, when we think of ancient people, you know, pre prehistoric people, what do we think about? They're wearing skins, right? Well, no, they're not wearing skins. Think about what a skin would be like. Think about what leather would be like to be wearing in Florida. You're not going to wear leather in Florida because it's too darn hot. And on top of that, you're always wet. Right? Either you're sweating or you're in the water or you're, you're all of sweat. And so uh, they would have never used skins in Florida. As soon as they could, they were making these beautiful fibers. And what's neat about the fibers is the finest of them. Uh, most of them were just a little heavier than a t-shirt. But the finest of them, they, they used those to wrap children that had died. They loved their children so dearly. And you have to imagine now, for a people living on the edge, to make fibers, to make cloth that's so fine, right, that you can absolutely distinguish it from any other cloth that they built to wrap dead children in. That was a very, very important thing. And did they need a lot of clothing? No. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is all the Spanish expeditions that came in talked about them wearing approximately the same thing, and that's a breech cloth. Right? You can see how it's worn here. It's just, it's just a piece of cloth tucked in and behind a, a belt-like kind of feature. Now, one thing that's really exciting about Windover is a lot of those people had broken bones. Uh, they were out there doing incredible things just to try to stay alive. One of them, the one of them pictured in this picture, you can't hardly see it, but uh, on his uh, left foot, He's got a wrapping around it, and there's something green hanging out. Well, that's a puntia, a prickly pear cactus, right? And they've wrapped that into it. He was born with spina bifida that was so bad that he would never was able to walk in all of his life. He lived until he was 14 years old. They took care of him until he was 14 years old. There was a woman also associated with these people that had a tremendous amount of bone breaks. It looks like she must have gotten in, <laughs> in some kind of a, a herd of buffalo or something that ran over her because she's so broken. Every one of them's healed. They're all healed, right? And the neat thing about it is when you're talking about long bone breaks, those bones are fit back together again to where it's almost difficult using uh, something like a, you know, a technical piece of equipment to find those breaks. They're so fine, and they've been put together so beautifully. And my feeling is that they're using, they're using rawhide, and what they're doing is they're wrapping it in rawhide. As, as the rawhide dries, it tightens up around the fracture and causes that fracture to tighten right in and the bones to be absolutely perfect. So these people, what did they do? Did they, did they take their elderly and dump them out on a, on a raft somewhere and say, sayonara, you're out here? No. 
It's the opposite. What we're, when we're looking at these primal people, people that were living in a very difficult environment, we're looking at people that took tremendous care of their people, all of their people, all the way around. Now, one of the things we find a lot of is we find these arrow points all over Florida. And one of the things I want you to notice is a lot of these points actually have names for the places that they were found, like Hillsborough and Pinellas and, and Tampa. Now, that's because the archaeologists found them there. A lot of them are mixed all over the state. But these things preserve. And because they preserve, they're one of the most common evidences of human beings. But it takes us, and it makes us focus too much on a male-oriented society. This is a, a, guy, a man who's actually working on making the points. And real quickly, uh, you'll notice down here, or right here by his tail end, there is a big antler-looking clunk. That, that's a hammer. And what he's doing is he's breaking off flakes of chert. Now, we don't have flint in Florida. We have chert. And it's a slightly, it's a little bit different in composition. And it's slightly finer. Uh, or flint is slightly finer than the chert. But the other thing that the gentleman is holding over here, that's an atlatl made out of a coyote jaw. And uh, so he's making these, these beautiful points. And one of the things I want you to, I want you to see is that this is uh, some points. And you can see the ruler next to it. And you see these little tiny points. They're about as big as your thumbnail. Now. Why were they making points like this? Well, I get a kick out of it. We're modern. And so what we look for is modern answers, right? And so somebody said, oh, they were using them to shoot down birds. You know, they're called bird points. And that's what the archaeologists and many historians want to talk to us about. But they're not bird points. Because you see a bird, if you're going to shoot down a bird, you don't even need a point. All you need is a stick that has feathers on the end of it, and you knock them out of the air. They're done, right? And once you bust up a bird, they're finished. They're not going anywhere. So you just go over and wring their neck. It's finished. What bird points are, and what these other points are, is points were also a symbol, right? People used them for prayer. And so the bird points are actually prayers. And what you do is you make a whole bunch of them, and then you go out and you throw them out into your fields where you're growing vegetation crops and things like that. So that's what bird points are. They're actually spirit points. Now, our people, the people here, we call them the Tokabaga, our people are Tunica speakers, okay? Tunica are a people that were way up the Mississippi River. When you think about our culture, the kind of people that were living here, you have to think that ours is a Mississippian culture. That's who we are. And they're Tunica speakers. Both, there's two groups of people I'm going to be talking about this evening, the Tokabaga and the Calusa, and both of them are Tunica speakers. And here you have a map of Florida. You see where the Tokabaga are spreading along the coast. We don't know how far inland they spread. And the Calusa to the south of us. Both of these people are amazing in the quality of life that they were able to pull out of a very, very difficult environment. This is downtown St. Petersburg in 1879, right? Doesn't look like much, does it? When did St. Petersburg become a, a, a village? It really, that's what it was in, what, 1888, right? So this is before St. Petersburg even became a village. What you're looking at, the yellow marks there with the red marks that are kind of in a circle down here at the bottom, what you're looking at there is you're looking at a, once was a huge city. And this is a Temple Mound complex. And then all around the edge of it are other Temple Mounds or other mounds. Those are sighting mounds. Everybody here has heard of uh, Stonehenge, right? Right, and we know how people used uh, different sightings for astronomy. Well, that's what this was. This was a huge astronomical kind of a feature that was made up downtown St. Petersburg. And by the way, it was very, very populated. I've heard so many people talk about a very, very small population, and uh, that just can't be. Uh, as, as we talk about it, I'll, I'll make sure that you see how that doesn't work. They didn't have stone here, right? Doesn't exist, really. I mean, they had stone that you could get chert out of, which is just nodules out of limestone. 
but they don't have a stone that you can build with. So what was their building material? Well, their building material was Pinus aliata and Pinus palustris. Now you think to yourself, uh -huh. well, how this works is a Pinus aliata will grow to 130 to 140 feet tall. 40 feet of that is clean lumber, totally clean, no branches, nothing like that at all. So you're looking at a tremendous resource. If you've got a little bit of an imagination, you're going to be using every bit of that lumber. And they did. They had a lot of imagination. They knew how to do it. They lived in large houses. I got a kick out of it. Some of my friends who are archaeologists keep looking for, you know, single family houses. Well, these weren't single family people. These were people of the Mississippian, people of the long house. And that's who they were. And so they built big houses. Why would you want to build big houses in Florida? Well, think about the ceiling on this house that you're seeing in this picture. It's way up there. The amount of shade that you're getting out of that and cooling out of that is really helpful because all that hot air rises, right? And so where the people live is very, very cool. Now, the Cabeza de Vaca expedition was, uh, or the Narve expedition, Cabeza de Vaca was the guy who re recorded or wrote about it. He talked about a place in St. Petersburg, a single house that could hold around 300 people. And so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at big housing, not small housing. And to the south of us on the islands, you're looking at housing that is just simply incredible. There's a Bob Picard out of Miami and a couple other archaeologists did some work uh, in, in South Florida. And what they did is they discovered all kinds of post holes from trees that had been planted or, or pushed into the ground. And uh, they kept thinking that these people were building buildings over the fingers themselves. Why? Because don't we build over fingers? Well, sure, we build on fingers. They didn't. They built over the water. The fingers were where they dumped their, their garbage, right? And what kind of garbage were they dumping? Mostly shellfish. And so what they were doing is they were building up these shellfish fingers. You can actually see them uh, in, the, in, the, in the map here of Key Marco. You can see the fingers coming out. Now, the way I theorize it is they started out in the blue here, slowly working toward the green, and then the, the kind of khaki, and finally the red. So these things were expanding as families were expanding. They were growing longer and longer and longer out into the water. The decking was over the water. What, did, what would that mean? You have you know, huge decks over the water, shading the water, right? The wind coming off of the Gulf of Mexico, picking that up and sending it up through the, the building, right? It's an air conditioning system. That's what they got, right? Now, there's a little Spanish priest that came later, and he said, oh, they're awful. They're, they, they, they rain all day long. It rains all day long inside of them. They're just, they're, it's impossible to live in them. Why is it raining? Condensing. The water's condensing high up in the, on the ceilings and dripping down a little bit. That's what's happening. It's an air conditioning system. They'd already developed that. Uh, this is one of the houses that I, everybody is shocked that I did this drawing, okay? Because they say, how could they have built something like this? It's incredible. We know for sure, the Spanish describe it, that they built a house that the Spanish visited that had a single room that could hold 2,000 people. You design it. How are you going to design it? You know, the first building that I showed you, you could never hold 2,000 people in that kind of a building. So the only answer I could come up with was something like this. The Spanish also describe it as having massive windows. Well, why do you want big windows? Well, because you're trying to get a lot of cooling into those kind of buildings, okay? And the reason that the, 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 the roof has this funny pitch to it is because of wind. What you want to do is when you have wind coming in in Florida, you want to break that wind up, right? And so instead of having a constant plane where it would, that wind could catch it and begin to topple that thing over, you're going to create something that has a lot of variety in it. And this is what I've come up with. Did they really have a building like this? I don't know. But we do know that they had a building that could comfortably comfortably hold 2,000 people. When Menendez came uh, in 1566, when he visited, right, he brought a bunch of 
I think 20 soldiers, armed soldiers, into that building. And the native people inside of it uh, in, tried to entertain him with dances and all kinds of things. It's, it's huge, a huge building. Sticks like this, elderberry wands like this, were used by the Seminole people up until about 20, 25 years ago. They were still, women were still using them. And always a woman's breath into the fire because she is the giver of life, right? That's how you do that. That's a very important thing. Always she's the, the bringer of life. Now, you're a guy and you're out in the field doing the best you can and uh, you didn't make it home at, at night and so you want to get a fire started, so how are you going to do it? This is how it's done. It's very, very fast and very easy. It's a bow drill. You take and you wrap the bow into a stick and then wind that stick onto another wood piece of wood and in about eight seconds you have smoke, right? And I watched a man, actually I can't do this, but I watched somebody else do it. They were better than I was at it. But I, I watched somebody take it from the stick, right, into a fire in one minute, had a full fire in one minute. So, I mean, they really understood how to live in their world comfortably. Now, this, is this talks about a digging stick, but also you can see a throwing stick here. Women were out there a lot looking at whatever resources they could find, right? Not only were they finding shellfish and things like that along the, the coastal areas, but they were looking for berries and plants that they could eat. Uh, we have a friend, Andy Furk, who is a plant specialist in Florida, and he found 280 varieties of edible plants. These are wild plants growing in Florida. When you ask archaeologists and scholars about them growing plants, they want to tell you that, no, well, they didn't grow corn, they didn't grow this, they didn't grow... And when Elizabeth and I visited native people, in, uh, on the Kuna Islands, just off of the coast of Panama, uh, everybody had a little farm site right next to the house, right? By the way, they lived in communal housing as well, but they had a little farm site right next to it where the women would go out and get some of the fresh vegetables every day. And so it was very important. Foraging in those days brought in a tremendous amount of food resources. What the men were bringing in was a lot of solid protein, deer, they were hunting deer. But don't, don't think that they weren't hunting raccoons and opossums and whatever they could get, right? And the next thing was, is the amount of uh, mullet and mackerel. Fishing here was incredible. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in the fishing industry here. Uh, first job I ever had was with Pinella Seafood. And I worked out there in the bay as a fisherman. And it, it was an unbelievable little amount of fish that we were getting. The old timers used to tell me, this ain't nothing. This is just terrible. We've ruined it, right? I thought it was incredible. When you go back into the history of it, into the 1800s, and you listen to fishermen back then, they were talking about rivers of mullets, rivers of mackerel, right? It was thick with fish. Uh, there's one guy that says that uh, his uh, sailboat actually was slowed down by the amount of fish that it was sweeping through. That's how rich the environment was. Now, you listen to people say, well, there were just a couple thousand people living here. That's not how it works with human beings. What we do is we top out at how much resources there are, right? If there's so much food that you can barely walk down the street without having food thrown on you, right? You're gonna reproduce. And that's just the natural way of it. So there's no way we had a small population. I think we had a very large population here in Florida. Uh, by the way, when you have a population that big and you have a society that powerful, you're gonna protect it. And that's part of that too. So now let's look a little bit at the personal people and, and how they're living their lives, uh, men and women, and how you meet somebody and wanna marry them and raise a family and the thing is is it was a matrilineal society men went to live with their wives relations in their long house in their apartment complex you might say and so what you did if you wanted saw a lady that you were crazy about and you wanted to meet 
you would go over to her parents' house and show what a good worker you were and how you could take care of business and, and make things happen and how willing you were to chip in and do things right. And so that's what they were doing. I hear he's got a nice big redfish that he caught and she just went and got some water from a local uh, pond. Now, there were things that were sacred, right? Reproduction was sacred. You didn't just haphazardly reproduce in this world, right? When you wanted to, when you and your wife wanted to reproduce, you went to your elders and you said, look, we'd like a child. And they'd all talk about it. They'd say, well, what is it like? Uh, are we having storms? Is the weather good? Is everything healthy? Okay, time to have a child, right? This is a good time. Children to them were sacred. Okay, and so you didn't, it wasn't something that just happened. Uh, there were a lot of other things they could do to find pleasure and happiness. And so that's what they did. But uh, when it came to having children, uh, she would, her girlfriends would give her a little stone that they'd carved into just a funny little shape, an hourglass shape. And they would, she would put that in her breech clout. And as she worked during the day, it would fall through. It was telling her she was going to have an easy delivery. That's what everybody was praying for, was an easy delivery for her. Once she had the child, the child was always with her. She either wore it over her left shoulder, always over the left shoulder, or it was at her breast. They breastfed for four to four and a half years, and we know that from the tooth enamel, from their tooth enamel. They actually breastfed for that long. Now imagine what I'm talking about when I'm saying you're breastfeeding for four to four and a half years. What kind of a bond does that create between child and parent? The bond is absolute. It's so tight. It's incredible. I, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of Native Americans, and I can tell you that's true. Now, the other thing that you want to notice is when that child is here all the time, over your left shoulder when you're not breastfeeding, right? That kid sees you accomplishing tasks every day. It's an education that that kid is getting over his mother's shoulder. He sees you have to work, you have to do things in order to live a good life. And so he's a part of that educational system right from the moment of birth. And women, uh, it's a matrilineal society, so in a sense they were very special. There was a men's house when we talk about the chief, I like to call him a cacique, right? When we talk about the cacique, he would have had a big building that he would have entertained people in. But at the same time, there was a women's house where women went to when it was their time of the month. And all women gathered there. It didn't matter what clan you were. Uh, you were a part of the women's house, and you would go there, and your sisters would take care of you. And I've talked to Native American women that said, eh, sometimes you just get tired of family life. I mean, you know, it can be really demanding. And so, what the heck? You say, well, I guess I gotta go to the women's house, and off you go. <laughs> you know? Now, when Menendez comes and visits that magnificently huge house, uh, that we were talking about, or seen earlier, uh, he, they write that there were groups of women as, he, as his soldiers marched up towards that building. There were groups of women, groups of 50 women, all around that building, and they were singing, right? What Menendez didn't realize is that in that culture, women are the historians. They're the ones that keep up all the family ideas and everything. And what these women were singing is about their clans and how wonderful their clans were and how powerful their clans were and how good everybody was. All right, that's what they were telling. And poor Menendez, he was Spanish. He didn't speak the language at all. He didn't have a clue what they were talking about. Now you'll notice a man in dark paint. That's a Calusa. A chief or, or headman, right? His name was Carlos. And that color that he's got on his skin actually came from Cuba, had to be imported from Cuba. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us they were uh, trading with Cuba, right? Okay. So the, every step of the way is so amazing with these people. Now, this is Tocobaga. In uh, 1567, Menendez comes here. To St. Petersburg area, actually to uh, Philippi Park, 
is where he goes. And the, the, they left downtown St. Petersburg. There was a war here, there was a battle here between the Spanish and the Indians, and the Indians lost. And once you do that, they, they, they pulled back way deep into Tampa Bay. And so uh, this is what I think uh, the cacique would have looked like uh, in those days. And what he's talking about is kind of incredible. Uh, there's 29 chiefs that will come to that meeting with Menendez. Now it's interesting because Menendez expects the chief, the king, right, to, to be able to tell everybody what to do. But you see, it's different. Uh, this is a whole different system. And you don't tell anybody what to do. This is a representative government, just like what we've got or tried to have today, right, as a representative government. And that's what these people did. They brought in uh, 29 sub-chiefs. It took four days for them to arrive. And with them came 100 nobles. By the way, there were about 1,500 other Native Americans that joined that group. So there, there were a lot of people uh, that wanted to see Menendez and talk to Menendez and see what was happening. What were the Spanish about? Because for the first time, uh, the Spanish didn't come to, with swords to chop them up into little tiny bits. And it's always nice not to be chopped up. Uh, now, one of the things that Menendez never could have understood is there was a women's side to the story. Remember, we've been talking about women. There was a women's side to the story. This is a casica. <coughs> The artifacts that she was found with was found in Tarpon Springs, the two copper plates that were there. And when they discovered those copper plates and they flipped them over, what they saw was fabric, right? Fine, beautifully woven fabric was impressed in those copper plates. So she wasn't wearing leather, she wasn't wearing fur, she was wearing cloth, right? And we know that. And the other thing that she has around her neck is uh, those are all sna snake vertebra that she's wearing. And right there where it comes together, right here in the middle, there's a single turtle vertebra. And that turtle is because we're Turtle Island, right? We're the people of the turtle. And she's got symbols of what she does. Women are the weavers. Women are the food bringers and the, the cooks and all of those wonderful things that women do. Okay, now we're getting into societies. We don't know. The historians never took the time to realize that women are alive, right? They, they just excluded them from history. And so we know they were there, but they just didn't have any importance. The males had three different societies that we know of. There's the peace society, the war society, and the contrary society. This is a contrary mask and a contrary person and what, what he's holding there is he's holding a stringer of uh, different plants, right? That he's gone out and caught with his net, right? The question is, is when you cast your net out into the world, do you know what you're going to catch necessarily, right? That's typical of contraries. Contraries were always there challenging either the peace society or the war society. If you were gonna get up and make a speech like I'm making, I would have had a contrary right here making fun of me, right? And the reason for that is because they wanted you to know everybody's just a person, you're just a person. And no matter how high your status, you're just a person, right? And so contraries were always there, but contraries were dangerous because of capital punishment where it was gonna happen, it was the contraries that were gonna hand it out. Contraries left their families behind. They did not have a family. When you became a part of the Contrary Society, you were a really unique member of that organization. All societies, all human societies are complicated. And these people were complicated as well. Now, these, uh, in today's world, it's not so uh, proper to talk about it. But in, when I was a young man, I took photographs of the Whedon Island skulls. And when I grew up, I ended up doing forensic reconstruction for the coroner's office. And so I began doing reconstructions of the skulls that I had taken photographs of. And these are what I found. These are some of the people that I found. These are our actual Whedon Island people. Now, in the winter months, autumn and winter was the time when the fish were here. And so they're out there in the water, really bringing in 
I don't think they were using cast nets so much. I think they could use cast nets, but I think mostly what they were using is they were using pilings. They were putting pilings in. Every family would have had, or every totem would have had their own particular area that they were putting pilings into. And as the mullet came through and got caught, they would harvest them. The neat thing of it is, is they understood that if you harvest too much, guess what? Next year's gonna be light. And so what they would do is they had big festivals. And the festivals, uh, stopped everybody from fishing. So right there in the heart of the fishing season, when everything should have been fantastic, right, they were having a festival, right, so the fish could get through, get out, mate, and get out, and go on with life. And so what they did is they broke that up. And this is just the women processing uh, the mullet. By the way, they would have taken that mullet and they would have uh, ground it into meal, and that meal would have been stored for the summer months, the hard times to come, the summer months. We never think of it that way, right? The summer months should be great. But uh, in fact, they still did fishing, but fishing was a little lighter in the summer months than it was during the winter. When it came to canoes, they had a variety of canoes. I've talked to a lot of archeologists about that. And none of them have been doing the research on canoes. Um, the truth of it is, is we know that they had canoes that they were doing long distance trading with. And this shows a, a young man working with his uncle. Uh, the uncle is using a blowpipe, same thing, using a blowpipe to burn uh, out some of the inside of the canoe. And then he'll carve it out with a hand axe made out of a shell. Now, what's really kind of interesting about that is that there was such a variety of canoes. Uh, when I and Elizabeth visited the Kuna Islands, right, there were canoes for children. They were building canoes for, I mean, we actually, stayed with people that were still using dugout canoes, right? And they were, they were making smaller canoes for children. And the kids were like, you know, have you ever watched kids on bicycles? You know, they'll do anything. I mean, it's just incredible what they'll do. They'll do cartwheels on the darn things darn near. Well, these kids were running up and down the gunnels of the canoes, you know, and jumping in the water and being crazy. They didn't worry about it. It was fun of them. Now, uh, there is evidence that they were using uh, something that, like a catamaran, where they would tie these canoes together. The Spanish actually wrote about something like that. They found something like that in Key Marco, but the archaeologists were very critical about it, and they said, well, there's no real proof that that was the way it was designed. So, well, you know, artifacts, what can you say? <laughs> you know, sometimes wood, guess what? Wood falls apart, you know? Now, when you have all the resources that we're talking about here, you're gonna to have to protect them. And one of the resources that was very important, of course, was the water and the waterways. And so they would have had gorgeous canoes that were specifically designed for one thing and one thing only, and that's warfare. Oh, by the way, with the canoes, what they would do, the trade canoes, they take them up the rivers in uh, West Florida and they drop them off at the head of the river because Florida has an escarpment that goes across it. And so the river, rivers from the center of Florida run to the west and rivers from the center of Florida run to the east. But they don't go all the way across, right? And so what they do is they take the canoe up, drop the canoe off, carry their stuff over to the other side of the river, get into it, go up the east coast, right? And uh, they leave their canoe there for people that were doing the opposite coming in the opposite direction, taking it down the west coast. So they were sharing it. They were sharing their trade. And by the way, we really know that with pottery. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Oh, those were, here, let's see. These are women making pottery. They would have been the potters, right? And uh, what they're doing here is they're acting silly. Now, it's hard to do that with art. You know, how do you make people acting? Well, there they are, they're acting silly. And the reason for that is when women made pottery, they made it for their families. And you wanted to put the spirit of joy and foolishness into it. So because everybody needs to be happy, everybody needs to feel good. And so you want to have a, a kind of a, a party, a gathering, where everybody's having fun. And making these pots for your family to, to eat out of. And these are, now this is, these are shamanic pots. These are pots that were specifically made for, for one thing only, and that's the spirit world. What they would have done is they would have taken these to a burial mound 
and they would have broken them up at one point. Later on, they would put a hole in the bottom of it so that it was pre-broken and they didn't have to break them up because they were beautiful. This is, this is Weed and Island punctated and it's the common, more common pottery. Everybody would have had a plain pot that they were cooking in and I know, I'm getting the signal that I gotta keep going. And pottery, by the way, was also a good thing that you could use to write on because that, they wanted to express themselves. They didn't have the same kind of ideas that we had out of Europe, but they needed to express themselves. And these are two pieces, uh, the one over here, uh, that comes from Pinella's Point, and it was actually found in Pinella's Point. One of the other things that women did with pottery is they would smack the wet pot with these paddles, and the paddles would leave an impression uh, on them. Now, I believe that each one of these marks is totemic. In other words, it tells you who owned that pot so that nobody else could come along and take it. Trade, there was a lot of it. A lot of trade went on here. And uh, here they are with uh, some traders coming in with their canoe. Most of what they were trading was perishables. It's, they just didn't last. And so when we're looking for the things that they would have traded, it's very rare to find anything. What we find is uh, greenstone salts and, and uh, quartz crystals. Everybody here knows quartz crystals don't come from Florida, right? There's no such thing in Florida. And now this is just to me, this is amazing. These are actually wooden bowls. And, I, and Elizabeth and I, we've actually got a chance to touch one of them. They're so thin, they're so light. And they, they look like somebody did them on a lathe. Some of them are so beautifully round. They were very, very skilled at woodworking. Uh, this deer's head comes out of Key Marco. Look at the detail, the beauty that has created. And the, these people are artists, right? Now this is a funny one. Remember the mounds? How if you put a mound in an ordinal direction, you could get two sacred things out of it? Same thing here. This is a horned alligator. <laughs> and there's actually a drawing of this that the native people still left behind. So we know that this is the way the darn thing looked. Uh, these are shell uh, columellas on the inside of it, a, a cat mask. This would have been typical of a totemic eye object. You, know, you would have seen this now. All kinds of tools, all kinds of things were being built by these people. They were very industrious, always working at it. By the way, the people that we visited in Panama, uh, they say when a man is, is sitting and not doing anything, uh, that's not good. He needs to be busy all the time. And what men do uh, is they make baskets there. Okay, this is typical of how they would have carried things. This is called a parfilegi. Uh, the bone pin holds, holds it together. It's something that you just put together so that it'll be like a purse. But this was their idea of it. The other thing I want to address real quickly is how long did they live, right? Now everybody says, oh, geez, they lived till 30 years old. Well, that's not true at all, right? The lady that you're seeing here, this is an actual person, right? Now, this is from a real skull. And there wasn't a suture left in her skull. I mean, all the suture lines had been totally, totally grown together, right? She had to be 70 years old. She wasn't unusual in Whedon Island, right? Now, there are burials where there's a lot of young people, but you've got to remember how these people buried. They didn't bury it like we do, just a general population. They, you always belong to a totem, right? And we need to get people to understand that. Uh, there's a couple little things here. Uh, sandal, yes, they would have worn sandals because uh, uh, things like shells can be really sharp, like in oyster beds, not good. They did tattoo, a lot of tattoos. Everybody wore tattoos. As soon as somebody saw you, they wanted to know who you were, they could look at your body and tell. Uh, the other thing up here are units of measure. There, we find lots of, unit of units of measure. So they were already doing that kind of thing. We're not talking primitive at all. And uh, this is a rattlesnake priest, right? And how I think he would have looked. They, were, they saw their world as a part of themselves. They were, it was intricate, and they were intricate within it. Uh, on the end of the canoe, here you'll see a circle with a little hole in it. You put a post into that, uh, that hole, and what you got is you got a compass, right? You get out there in the water, 
and you'll watch that and watch how it progresses. And so they would have had something like that too. There's a lot going on in there. Uh, there's a, a, an argument over here where somebody's done something wrong and they're getting into trouble. There's a parade over in the background and note, note the dogs. It's a Carolina dog. It was very common at that time. This is their agriculture and I don't care what anybody says, they were doing agriculture, right? And so uh, they were using a digging stick to dig a hole. Uh, the wife would have put in the seeds. The daughter is putting in fish guts and things like that. They actually knew how to do that. You've heard that from Squanto. I've actually heard people say, well, Squanto didn't know that. He had to learn that from the English. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, dancing. Uh, that was a real part of everyday life, and it was a spiritual thing. So Elizabeth and I have actually done stomp dancing. And dancing can be uh, entertaining, and dancing can also be spiritual. And what a stomp dance does is everybody lines up in a spiral, all right? The caller walks around a ceremonial fire and they'll call the prayer and everybody repeats the prayer so that you're putting all of that power and energy into that prayer. And sports, they loved sports. Uh, and women, I don't have any illustrations of that, but women had a whole bunch of games that they loved to play. So this is called the little brother of war. Instead of going to war, well, let's, uh, let's get together and have a ball game. If you win, you get what you wanted. If I win, I get what I wanted. And so a lot of territorial disputes were cleaned out by uh, sporting events. Did they have bad times and bad weather and hurricanes? Remember these buildings, they're designed for it. What happens when a hurricane comes in and blows the roof off of the house, right? Blows, the, blows the, the walls out. Those walls are nothing but woven material. That's all they are. Blows them away. So when it, they're, they're all blown out, you come back after the storm's gone, and what you have is a frame. Put it all back together again, all right? Medicine and medicine women. Uh, med we forget that there were medicine women as well. I've talked to a lot of Native Americans that are shocked that we never asked about medicine women. We always said, where's your medicine man, right? And then we'd get medicine man stuff, right? And that's all men's, men's magic. That's all men's medicine. Right, and by the way, every one of you is a medicine because the people that you know and you love, when they see you, they feel good, right? You're a medicine, right? And they would have understood that, by the way. Uh, this is actually surgery. Did they do surgery? We find these weird points. The one point here in the middle, uh, we find that that's fairly common. That's called a drill. Now, I, I nap flint. And so I made a whole bunch of these things and tried to drill with them. You put them on a piece of wood and you start to drill with them, the points just break off and it grinds itself up. So it's not a drill, right? But if you put your fingers across those little wings that stick out, what you have is a scalpel that will not spin or turn in your fingers and you know exactly where that scalpel is going. So I really believe that they were doing a lot of that kind of medicine. They saw their world as something beautiful. When the Spanish came here, they were after, after gold, right? And they saw power in fear. If they could make you afraid, they were powerful. Now, our, our native people didn't see the world that way. Uh, now a little bit of spirituality. Quetzalcoatl, uh, you might have heard that name, the feathered serpent. Well, when you think of the feathered serpent, do you ever think of well, what a water spout looks like when you're out there on the bay? Oh, that's what it looks like. It looks like a feathered serpent. Their world did things to them. And so these amazing things that were happening all around them, they interpreted them the way they would, right? Now, this is the devil's mill hopper is at the, at the top. And it's a huge hole, a uh, sinkhole, down near Gainesville. You can go there anytime you can go there and visit it. And what's really weird is at the bottom of the sinkhole, you see this little stream come out of a rock wall on one side, goes across uh, this little uh, kind of prairie there in the middle, and goes right into another rock wall. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah, now that's weird. But then you get to uh, Alino, and what Alino does is it's the Santa Fe River. The Santa Fe River is going along. It's a nice river. You can canoe on it. You can swim on it. Have a great time on it. All of a sudden, it plunges underground. Boom, gone. Right? And that's what you're seeing here in the background. That's it. It's gone. All right? So it goes into the cave system. 
a mile down the road, it pops up again. What do you think about when you're an ancient person and you're seeing these kind of things? This is your spiritual world. That's the world that they are really in contact with constantly. Now, burial mounds. Again, burial mounds are totemic. And also, what we need to remember is that these people, uh, they lived on the water all the time, most of the time. And so, so many of their totems, so many of the things that they were a part of were part of the water. And so they naturally would have ended up back in the water again. And when the Spanish came, of course, all of this would come to an, an abrupt end. And by, by the 1700s, it was over. But the place where we are, the place where we walk, it was at such an incredible place, so filled with human life, and so filled with fun, and hard times and pleasures, just like our lives are. But it was the past. Thank you very much, anyway, for... Uh,